Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Liam Crutt. Liam is an investment partner with Reinforced Ventures. Liam, welcome to the pod. Thank you much for having me, Spencer. Thanks for coming on. So I don't meet a whole lot of venture capitalists, and I was kind of curious, how does one get into that field? It, there's a high degree of variance. Um, I think kind of the most common path is people have an exit from the company they're involved with, may want to have less of an operator role um, for the next phase of their career, or they have some finance background from like, it seems a lot of UPenn guys, um, and then they get involved um, from there, you know, maybe second wave or second tier is a lot of PhDs. So especially in more science oriented areas of finance, and someone might get their PhD in chemistry or biology or physics. And at that point, um, they'll get brought on. I was getting big early 2000s where you had these essentially first rise of mega funds, people were lar- raising larger amounts of money. And if they had you know three or four PhDs lined up working for their fund, then they could command larger management fee. So oh, being, interesting. being able to bring in more money up front and have a larger fund to deploy capital later. And then probably third wave would be AngelList and a number of these other open platforms where pretty much anyone can qualify. And yeah. that's important because certain sectors in the market might be more tail end, require more specialization. And so a typical tract might not make sense for that person, right? They might not have gone there. PhD at Stanford or their MBA with a finance concentration at UPenn. And yet they have something that they can offer to the market in an area of focus that they have that gives them an insight no one else has. For me, it was kind of a mix of all three, but none of the above. Nice. So I started two companies, um, one in biotech. So it was an mRNA therapeutic startup. Oh, cool. The other was in cybersecurity and blockchain. Those are totally different things. Totally different things. <laughs> I, I'm more of a generalist. Um, yeah, me too. And studied economics, computational biology, and then kind of you know built my career out in data science. And after a while, it it kind of just slowed down. wasn't what I wanted to be doing. And I decided, all right, you know, having a plan isn't working out too well. Let's try having no plan. COVID happened, which no one planned for. Yep. <laughs> and so was working from home, essentially had two hours a week to use however I wanted. And I told my wife, I was like, hey, like instead of spending this time with family, I'm just gonna take those two hours and do the funnest thing I can, right? No plan, just maximizing funness for those two hours. Yeah, with and the family or two hours by yourself? By myself. Okay, got it. Yeah, no family, apparently. Got it, unstructured time, two hours a week. Family is fun, but no, sorry, two hours a day. Oh, so my it, commute sorry. time, I was applying to finding a better career. Got it. And within like a week. Um, what were you doing at the time for your, your day job when you were commuting? I was a data scientist for Allegheny Health Network. Oh, so interesting. Pulling a lot of their data, um, looking for new ways to predict diseases, helping doctors kind of choose and clean their data sets and working Remotely is a fairly easy thing to do there because yep. you're just Makes sitting sense. at a computer and writing code. Yeah, I would think any software person could do that I mean, was, for the most part. It was actually really interesting to do it just as code was happening because you see like all this data coming in, you're like, no one knows what this is and you get the raw data, right? There's no- So you had access to the hospital data as COVID, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and everyone was asking for it. <laughs> But I mean, I'm guessing it was like HIPAA, you know, you couldn't just share it, right? I mean. Yeah, no, so. there, there was a long kind of um, application process and approval. And I was pretty much the gate, one of the gatekeepers for, you know, letting people see certain data versus not. And so they had to be very specific about what they want and then we pull that data for them. That makes, this is so tangential, but like, how do you scrub that data for public consumption? Like, do you just have to wipe people's names off it? It, it depends okay. on what they need and how they need. There are some areas where they might need the names. Like if you're trying to predict who's most likely to have cardiac arrest in the next six months. Um, but other areas, yeah, you, you scrub for things like names, you 
produce a secondary index to kind of file who's what, what, what would be an example of a secondary index just to understand uh just one two three four five six seven eight nine got it so just say just a, a file yeah an index just like, using you know, sql it. or python yep. pretty, pretty simple stuff one plus the line before <laughs> yep um so within my first week of not having a plan i saw on linkedin that um, Carnegie Mellon's Alumni Association, Tepit, here in Pittsburgh, was looking for someone to interview entrepreneurs. I was like, that looks like fun. And so that was kind of the first iteration of that recursive algorithm. Started interviewing people, meeting more people, was having a good time. Um, and then started interviewing some venture capitalists on the side. So that took me from two hours a week to five hours a week. And then a buddy of mine I thought you said two hours a day. A day, sorry, yes, okay, no two worries. hours a day. Cool. So you um, just did sleep, just take a back seat at that point? I don't remember, so no probably. Worries. <laughs> Fair enough. And then um, started interviewing more people, um, helping out with some administrative things, so that brought me up to five hours a week. A buddy of mine um, recommended a local investor, Ewan Guttridge, who's like, you should talk to this guy. We hit off on the first call, and I offered to do due diligence with him and what he was doing at Reinforced Ventures. So that took me up to 10 hours a week and then um, started receiving compensation. That took me up to 15 hours a week, right? And so a week just, or a day? I keep saying, sorry. No, I just want to make sure I'm following correctly. Now we're at 15 hours a week. Yes. Okay, okay, got it. Goodness. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't two hours a day be 14 hours a week if you're working weekends? Just, I just want to make sure I'm tracking. And... It's been a while since I've thought this. Um, so I would, two hours, so not including weekends, so I guess okay, so be, starting, you started at 10, you went up to 15. I probably started at like five. Okay, okay, so like an hour a day up to- Yep, so five to, up to 10 three to hours 15. a day. Yeah, okay. And then when I got to 15 hours of having fun, I just got this weird feeling that I could jump from 15 to 40, and so- While working for AHN or like quitting that job? No, quitting okay, got and it. kind of going full time and reached out to a buddy of mine, Scott, in North Carolina and said, hey, you know, I, I know you've done due diligence for venture capital firms. I'd like to move into this. I, I just, it feels right, feels like the right timing. Um, and he's like, well, like, you know, I don't have any good options there, but I'm doing private equity due diligence now. Do you want to join us full time? And I was like, well, it sounds like fun. And so I was doing that. Um, at that time, still, you know, working with Ewan on evenings and weekends, and then Ewan and I launched a fund for Reinforced Ventures October of last year, so about oh, a cool. year ago. That's and, awesome. Yeah, so it went from, you know, yeah, five to ten hours of fun per week to now, you know, well over 40 nice. hours per week. And, um, yeah, no plan at all, just kind of iterating over What's the most fun thing that's immediately adjacent? I to like I like using recursion as an analog for that because I feel like that fits. Okay, what can I do now? Okay, what can I do now? Okay, yeah. how do I make this more fun? Lily padding, yeah. or, you know, whatever <laughs> people refer to it as. Yeah. So, and yeah, the, the fun's been growing great. We've been performing super well. Um, we've seen a lot of cool stuff here in Pittsburgh, but have also been investing internationally, and. Um, so what was the, yeah. oh, sorry. I mean, no, the, no, please, that's it. I was going to say, what was the focus of your first fund with, because it sounds like Reinforce was already around, but then you and you and started a new fund. What was, what differentiated that fund? Yeah, it was kind of just doubling down on our expertise. Okay. So at first we were looking at whatever seemed to be interesting. You could call it maybe a generalist model with a focus towards the deeper areas of tech. So robotics, autonomy, uh, fintech, biotech, um, advanced materials. But then when we launched the fund, we were like, well, all fun stuff. The things that we actually know happen to be performing the best. So let's just dogmatically double down on what we're good at. And so now, you know, we're in, a, we're a year into exclusively investing in things like robotics, biotechnology, therapeutics, platforms, autonomous self-driving systems. And that's been going extremely well. Nice. Um, in addition to that, you mentioned the recursion, like we're not really taking a criteria based approach because you look at a lot of these, when you say criteria based approach, criteria compared to constraints. So a lot of venture capital firms 
might have a prediction about what they expect the future to look like. Okay. And that's really hard to do. Um, for us, we've more developed a set of constraints and an agnostic approach where we don't know what the future is going to look like. Yeah. But we can at least try to predict what it won't look like. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> and so with that, you know, it, just some examples, it's not exhaustive, but maybe the global constraints would be irreplaceable competency. So if the founder gets hit by a bus, um, is there anyone else in the world with their expertise? Thing number two, is it a platform play? I.e., the second product they build is 10x lower cost than the first and the third and fourth. Can you give me an example of a platform play just so I can track that? Sure. So on the biotech side, that might be more like they've discovered a new class of molecules. You can do pretty much anything with these molecules, right? Maybe they're very good at binding and recognizing proteins. Okay. Um, so the first one, you know, it might take you three years to develop that first therapy. The second one, it might take you only six months, right? So okay. there's some basic technology and then you're just applying it to different targets. So demonstrated competence through the initial thing is considered the platform that the rest of it's based off of? Sure. Okay, yep. I see. Um, and you know, same on the robotic side. So you might have, let's see, like we invested in um, Dawn Robotics, startup out of Canada, and they essentially have a new barcoding system. Yeah, I do want to learn more about these guys. Tell me more. Yeah, sure. So Dawn Robotics has a new barcoding system that can take large amounts of data and embed it into physical systems. So QR code, you know, can only embed a couple bits worth of data. These guys can embed megabytes worth of data. So you can have a real-time video feed that can flex on cloth or material. That's pretty cool. For like augmented reality applications or, you know, if a piece of furniture in a showroom, you want to just like click through different fabrics. You're doing that on fiducial? Real. Say again? You're doing that on some kind of fiducial? You're able to embed that much data? Yep. And um, really like okay. where the idea came from is they were working on medical applications, so sutures, yeah. and being able to follow the suture during a surgery. And what they realized was- It's more of a localization problem, I would think. Um, not so much localization problem. Because well, you want to know where that hook needle's at, right? Or am I? The, the issue was more tracking the image in real time and seeing how, how it was bending okay. and being able to follow that and being able to recognize when something is out of view, i.e. behind itself. Got it. Versus in view. Or occluded by something else, like the surgeon's hand, for yep, instance. exactly. And the medical student's hand, for instance. It's the suture. <laughs> and um, so eventually they just realized, like, well, what if we just stacked those strings on top of each other? Then, you know, you could embed much more complicated objects. So everything from packaging, if you want to tell if there's, you know, a hole that's been poked or a break or a tear, or if you want to put a video on fabric or whatever, there's a wide range of applications for the same basic technology. So that's something that, you know, there's a million definitions for what a platform is, but that's how we would look at it. And that sounds platform. groundbreaking. I mean, I, I would be very interested to see a demo from those guys. Yeah, no, I'm happy to link you one for sure. sure. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny though, with all the deep tech stuff, you f it feels super new and cutting edge, but a lot of this stuff is, it, it's just kind of a, kind of a, um, blanking. No worries. Um, so something that's already existed, maybe if I'm taking a guess that you're applying to a field that's not been in before. It, it could be the same field, but it's really just coming back around to something that um, had existed decades ago. So like barcoding systems were first used, you know, I think as far back as the 1960s for train right. cars, right? So you had a train that would come into a station and they would have these slots on the side of it. And based on the frequency of the slots, you That's could tell in catalog which train car had come into the station. And then you had um, kind of a second wave with grocery stores. So being able to tell what food when did that come into play with grocery with? stores, just like curiosity. Say again? When did grocery stores start using barcode in? That was the mid seventies. Okay. It was pretty soon after um, the train. So I don't know if that would technically be a second wave or like the first wave, but 
a bigger first wave. That's interesting. And um, then you had QR codes in the 2000s, and now, you know, with embedding augmented reality into, <clears throat> you know, physical prints. So you're talking about like April tags like, and, and things for localizing an object and then abstract. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Um, so, yeah, that would be an example of a platform play. And then the third kind of global criteria that we use is, is this an overlooked area? So right now, you know, quantum computing batteries are really big and we don't look at those areas. We're looking for those things that are overlooked, which is hard to do because if you don't know where to look, how do you find the things you're looking for, right? Yeah, so, makes a lot of sense. Um, you, there's some proprietary heuristics that we have for that, but like probably the most obvious one is just inverting. So when people invested in autonomous cars, we invested in autonomous trucks. Oh, interesting. Locomation is um, a great company. I had Chetan on. Actually. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, he's great. And um, Tekken's supposed to come on, but he get, keeps getting busy. <laughs> um, what would be another example? When people when a lot of investors were going after you know, monoclonal antibodies, especially a lot of the in silico design, um, we invested in RNA Aptimer startup. So that's a little bit outside my competence, <laughs> if I'm being honest. I, it's all good. I'm going to explain it here. Sweet. Um, both audio and video. So if a antibody is a honing beacon shaped like the letter Y, okay, they could go and latch on to either a binding site on a protein or on the surface of a cell, one of the receptors. An RNA aptamer is similar to that, except instead of using proteins to make that honing beacon, you're using RNA. So okay. the RNA folds onto itself in a three-dimensional object. And that allows you to have um, greater simplicity so you can design completely on a computer, um, lower cost for manufacturing. You don't have to you know, inoculate any horses or yeah. pigs or whatever. Well, is that because there's just less RNA than there are proteins? And so the target's more apparent? Uh, again, I'm kind of speaking as a layperson. No, all good. It's, RNA is just a lot simpler, right? So, you know, to build proteins, at least in cells, right, you have to go from the genome, right, with how, what portions that are open or closed based on the histones to the DNA and the DNA to RNA and then RNA to protein, and then post-translational um, modifications, right? There's like all these steps. Yep. With RNA, you can you know, spit out a sequence of DNA from a computer. You can do cell-free synthesis. You can use yeast cells. Like it's much That's simpler cool. than with the antibodies, where it's like even after those post-translational modifications, you have the inoculation and all this stuff that like uh, vaccines are involved with, for instance. Um, so the risk of sounding dumb, are you just essentially catching it earlier in the synthesis process? Or? From like a very meta philosophical standpoint, yes. Okay, I see what you're saying. But also using RNA, you have greater options for stability. You don't have as many risks with setting off an immune reaction that you don't want. You can target small molecules. Like there's a lot of flexibility there. Oh, interesting. Because yeah. an R RNA would not be considered foreign regardless of the encoding? Right. It's not okay. It's not going to, most likely it's not going to trigger off a similar immune response. In That's really interesting. I had no idea. Yeah. No, it's pretty cool. And um, it just seems like a great way for some disease to sneak in too. <laughs> <laughs> From RNA? Well, yeah. I mean, if it's not going to set up your immune system, you know, it seems like an awesome way to introduce something malicious as well. Oh, as I see it. what you're saying. Well, yeah. actually, um, you know, there is one cohort um, of pathogens that does use RNA to sneak in. Interesting. And that's viruses, right? So some viruses are double strand DNA, other viruses use RNA. And, you know, that's why your skin, your saliva has a lot of enzymes called RNases because those RNases snip up foreign RNA that they oh, find on their exterior. So how do you keep the RNA you're trying to introduce from triggering that system and getting snipped up as it were? Currently it's introduced intravenously. Okay. So, you know, for applications they're using either short inhibitor RNA, mRNA, um, or others, you know, you could have some sort of drug delivery mechanism that, that would then take it to the right location, whether that's um, liposomal or, you know, you could actually use viruses, right? You could change the RNA within that virus so that it sends good RNA and not bad RNA. Um, that's, we have a that's startup in our portfolio that's using 
um, immune cells actually oh, to cool. develop to deliver nucleotide payloads, which again is an overlooked area and part of the difficulty with like you have to be dogmatic to like clearly see what's good and what's not, but you also don't want to be dumb. So, you know, up until recently, I thought the CAR T space, right? So like using immune cells for therapies to be generally correct, but exactly wrong in that definition. Um, it was hyped up. It was a buzzword, right? Like people thought it was going to be some great thing, but you know, eventually it's like, well, what are the overlooked areas of CAR T? Because everyone what is CAR T just to it's so, using Sorry. immune cells okay. for therapies, Got it. right? Okay. If you're like, hey, let's take immune cells out of a person's body to fight cancer, right? Yeah, that, that's so you take different. someone's immune cells, modify them, then reintroduce them. Yep, and they're not foreign because they're taken from that person. So we we invested in a team recently at Eddie Therapeutics, and what they did was they're like, well, instead of just delivering the same, you know, bullet to kill these cancer cells that, you know, a thousand other um, startups are doing, why not be able to swap that bullet for a medication, for a therapy, right? And now we turn that gun into something that doesn't just kill, but can heal. So they're leveraging all the delivery capabilities of the research from, you know, these thousand clinical trial efforts right now and going after a market that's completely overlooked. And so, you asked me six months ago, I'd be like, ah, CAR-T is, you know, totally overblown. Everyone's in it. It's way too frothy. But now it's like, oh, maybe it's so big that there is an overlooked area even within CAR-T. So that, that's kind of how we generally think about things. Um, regarding our structure, you know, we have a proper fund that we write checks out of. And then um, we also have a group of about 1,600 engineers, entrepreneurs, and scientists who will then do follow-on investments in later rounds with us. They'll make um, introductions to customers, sit on advisory boards. They're really the professional services that we can scale up for our uh, venture firm. I, I think the best way to describe it is if you have like a bell curve or a Gaussian distribution. It's the long tail. It's the long tails, right? They're like, yeah, yeah we need like to talk to this one, you know, automobile manufacturer in Spain, right? Like your accelerator program probably doesn't have that, but you know, it has most of the things you do need, right? And you know, we do have those connections to those very odd, peculiar, and niche things that you might not get elsewhere. That's interesting. You said how many thousand? Uh, 1,600. That's a big number. It is. It's <laughs> a lot of people to deal with. <laughs> but I like, I, I don't know all of them personally Makes so far, sense. right? Some of them, it's just one-way communication and they invest where they want. Um, but so far, I like every single one. I mean, most of them are just engineers and nerds, right? So they're like, yeah. they're super easy and super great. And probably just eager to find out what's wrong with it and fix it. You know, yeah. I think. yeah, they fix all my problems. Nice. <laughs> I, I, I think SKA employs a similar model, except it's all engineers and nerds that, you know, I mean, we're smarter together, right? Like, I don't know everything. But me and five other people know a lot more than me. And so, you know, I believe the more folks you get involved in a problem, I mean, it gets expensive at a certain point, you get diminishing returns, but the better you're gonna be at solving that problem. So. How are you kind of cataloging or documenting who knows what? Like if there's some yeah. issue and you don't know who the expert is for that, what So do you currently do? our network's only 75 people, so there's not really a need for that sort of thing, mm -hmm. but we're thinking about implementing an ERP to kind of tackle that going forward. How do you catalog that? Very cool. Um, how do I catalog? I, I mean, I keep a Google spreadsheet up and anytime I'm catching up with one of them, I take notes. So just very selfishly ask, you know, how can I best use you? And like, what skills do you have? What weird things? I mean, that seems have? like a two-way question though. I don't know if that's actually selfish because everybody wants to be used and- Yeah, know. no, I mean, it's it's all like fun stuff, right? Yeah. Like it's not, <laughs> it's not a slog, but there have been a couple um, tail end situations we've had so far where like I didn't know who to reach out to. <clears throat> it's an, it's a good example of how our network works. So we invested in a uh, Columbus based startup called Volantra a few months ago. Uh, so this was kind of in our autonomy bucket. They're taking a turbo jet engine design like you might see at the airport with yep. the spinny fans on the front and a ramjet engine design like you might see in the movie Top Gun 
and bringing it together so that you get, um, you know. Is that what the SR-71 uses or? Ah, yeah, kind of. So, but so this is like jet. next level, right? So yeah, it's scramjet capabilities, but with active mixing of the fuel, the air, and having a much more effective afterburner, right? That's pretty Without cool. going into too much detail. No worries. Um, so I had breakfast this morning with a guy from Pratt and Whitney, so I'm like really interested in the subject. Yeah, um, I, I should probably introduce you to them. The Absolutely, really cool team. <laughs> but the kind of the, sh the short of it is, I, I like Navier Stokes. Like, you know, fluid dynamics is a beautiful thing, but I don't understand supersonic fluid dynamics. Right? Neither do I. So. And I didn't know who in our network would be good to reach out to about that either. So um, we had one guy who's, he was the head of um, Loom at Google and I reached out to him. Loon, so like the balloons. Yep, Okay. exactly. Um, That's interesting. He likes fluid dynamics as well. Yeah. And um, reached out to him, asked, hey, like, do you have anyone who would be good to talk to about this stuff? Because you know, once you have a sonic boom, you're going past the uh, sound barrier, you know, things change with the air, right? Yeah. yeah. And so he introduced us to uh, Dr. Thomas Juliano at University of Notre Dame, who's actually right now building a, what does he call it? A, um, I think it's called a quiet wind tunnel. So imagine soundproofing a wind tunnel so that when you're replicating um, an object going faster than the sound barrier, you don't have those energy waves coming back and disrupting the laminar flows over the vehicle, right? But how is that useful? Because I feel like that happens in real life and you're not going to be able to recreate that in the well, field. Well, if you're up in the, if you're, you know, up in the stratosphere or whatever, okay, so it's not you... like it's reflecting back in like it would inside a warehouse. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And, um, and I'm assuming the higher the altitude, the, the more that, like the more vacuum you're in, the less you're going to have to deal with those effects. Yep. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, and this is like, this is not for going directly into space. This would like be a two stage, right? So you okay. at least for now, um, I've been space adjacent a lot, but I've never worked directly on spacecraft. So yeah, bear with me here. Well, no, I, that's how I feel like with a lot of our stuff, because space isn't a core competency for us, but like, <laughs> that's the, it, it's like, well, it's a robot company that's in space. <laughs> like, does that make a difference? And um, so far it's been going super well. So like them, uh, Torian space. So essentially what they do is repairs. Apparently 40% of all satellites are to some degree not functioning correctly. That's interesting. I didn't realize it was that high. It makes sense though, because we've been launching those things for decades. Yeah, so in, yeah. in over those decades, right? Like you need a tilt adjustment. Maybe you have a solar panel that didn't deploy and you just need to give it a little tug. So you yeah. just like pop a robot arm on yeah your machinery and then you're good to go. I interviewed two people on this podcast that worked on in-flight satellite resurfacing robots. And I, I just think it's one of the coolest subjects ever. Yeah, it's uh, you, you, it's it's weird how big it is and how how like normal it is. Like there's like insurance companies for space satellites, you right? Serious? Yeah. Um, Does Chubb have a space policy, I wonder? <laughs> I do not know. Some of those companies are such dinosaurs. I, I shouldn't talk too much smack, but I feel like some like I was talking to a few insurance brokers to try to get a policy for project specific uh, reasons, and just some people just have no domain expertise of deep tech, as you put it. I mean, and it's it's challenging trying to make that work. And so, well, it, everything's bleeding edge, so you yeah. can't really be an expert. You're like. It's fair. constantly learning. So you're just speculating what's the worst could happen without knowing a ton about that field. Um, no, so there's definitely a methodology to it, right? So I, I already mentioned you, you bring on an expert to help with technical due diligence and you know, hopefully they'll ask questions Too you okay. don't know. Um, you know I, I do a ton of reading in all these different areas so that I at least know what questions to ask. And it's kind of like, so, so my dad was an interrogator for the military and then- Oh, that's cool, I didn't know that. And um, he, you know, Think of any movie with an interrogator, right? Like you start with general questions. It's all like, psychology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it might start with like, where were you last Saturday? Yeah. Right. Oh, what did you have for dinner? Oh, who did you eat dinner with? And you just get more and more specific, right? And then you catch someone in a lie. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Now, I mean, it's hard with um, like pre-seed, seed stage companies because everything's a lie, right? Like 
it's all aspirational. They're all oh, trying to start I don't know if I told that lie though, right? I mean, there's there's a difference between early stage aspirational and straight up making something up. No, but my my point is like yeah. you you do have to like kind of pull out the things where how much they actually understand, and sometimes there are things they don't understand. Which it's like, oh, that's good because they're at the cutting edge they're going to be the market leader in five years. Okay. Or it's like, oh, they don't understand that, and it's a bad thing, right? And so making a value judgment there is super crucial. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's being able to drill deep, being able to pull in the correct experts, and then just like reading a ton of information. That makes sense. Right, so luckily I enjoy research papers um, and you know Science Daily articles. So, so it's almost like the Richard Feynman thing where he talks about having an idea in his head of what someone's talking about. And then as they elaborate on the concept, applying that idea to those different iterations and variations. Yep. And, and when it breaks, that's when you start to get skeptical. Yeah. So like yeah. A, a good way to kind of tug on that. One, one question I like to ask people is, you know, what's the weirdest thing this could do in five years? So understanding the different applications that are available is super helpful there. That's interesting. So the weirdest thing is like, tell me an application that people might not expect. Yep. That's cool. And if it's intuitive, good. If after you hear it, right? If it's, ah, <laughs> then yeah, you might walk away. Yeah. When you say, uh, you mean if they're just making something up that doesn't fit the model? Or if it doesn't. Because I would think the weirdest isn't about profit generation. That's about out there. Well, and I don't know if it's this environment or just the personality of the people who tend to be in deep tech, but. Okay often they try to show that they like, oh, we can make a business and it's gonna go great. And they, they try not to scare off investors. And so when I say weirdest, the way people tend to interpret it is, this is a safe place for me to talk about like my real dream for where I want this Blade Runner project oh, to go I gotcha. in okay. five years. Yeah, That's interesting. Exactly. It, it's, it's crazy the answers you get there. Um, can you give me some examples without like, Still any beans you shouldn't? Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll mention a company we didn't invest in, um, not by name, but um, they had some particular hardware modifications that they were making in the trucking industry, um, which looked like a really great model. Um, it didn't feel platformy enough, and there were a couple other things. Nothing wrong with the business. Yeah. Uh, just Did might not be the best fit for us. Like, yeah. And so when I asked them um, what that weirdest thing was, he's like, Honestly, in 10 years, I want to be producing nuclear trucks that run on nuclear energy. <laughs> I was it's like, like that, some Edwin Teller stuff. Yeah. <laughs> At that point, I was like, all right, how do I give you my money? You know? Um, so it was probably the most convincing thing he said. But yeah, you get you get some really cool answers like that. Um, That's interesting. With Dawn Robotics. Oh, I hope I get this right. It was something along the lines of... Um, they wanted like a full augmented reality experience where wherever you're walking there's embedded data right that's pretty so the cool. front of someone's house the clothes they wear ar is data not being embedded in the cloud but being embedded locally on physical well, fabrics and you probably this. could go to the cloud to do ar but i see what you're saying you're talking yeah. about right there i mean we're, we're in a garage right now you know i don't, yep. I don't know how good you're LTE connection is so. I mean, we got Verizon FiOS at half a gigabit. We're not underground right now. I mean, we are underground. We're half underground. <laughs> we're we're <laughs> wine cellar temperatures. Okay, got it. <laughs> it's probably not ideal for white wine, but. Yeah. No, probably not. Yeah. But I mean, I'd store some reds in here. Toward, toward that back wall. Anyways. Um, Tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs> no, I can't. I, can't. Um, I, I got nothing else to say there. All right. Cool. Um, so what are, I guess, some of the fields you're looking to get into that you haven't explored yet? Like um, where, where do you see overlooked? Well, I guess you can't really there, there, disclose that. Yeah, there, there's like kind of the Karl Popper, um, what do you call it, falsification theory. I, I cannot know truth, but I can, um, right, like identify falsehoods, right? Interesting. Um, that said, there are cool areas that I'm like, I feel like there should be something here. So one way to think about it is like, what 
applications are there that maybe are too high for drones, but too low for low Earth orbital. Um, Ooh, interesting. In, in space graphene production. And then also... Um, Just a riff on that. Can I ask why you would want to produce graphene in space? Uh, for like low cost superstructures, right? Okay. So like if, if someone could like hose off, this, this is getting a little too out there, but like if someone could hose off part of Venus's atmosphere, right? Because it's like 80 or 90% CO2 and use that to produce graphene uh, structures that you could then fill in with glass and make like new space stations. That's pretty cool. And then the third, like a third example of something I would love to see, but have not seen yet would be um, like generative models, like in machine learning. Um, so like deep fakes, things like that yeah. applied to genomics. So a, a use case would be if someone if a pharmaceutical company was like, hey, we need a mouse to test this drug on, and we don't have a good mouse to do that on, right? And you go to your machine learning model and be like, hey, ML, generate this genome that has these characteristics, and then we would just like spit it out for you. You'd put it in an egg, right? Like so it's a almost like a step egg. above cloning because you don't have the original thing to clone. You want to make it up. Yep, just like completely in silico. Um, so there's some people I'm talking to about that. None of them have started companies yet. <laughs> Fair enough. But you know, that is the, the, probably one of the best part of my jobs isn't like just investing in entrepreneurs, but like talking to cool people doing science before they've even started the company yet. Um, so those would be three areas that I would consider overlooked. Yeah. That could, I could totally be wrong, right? Like maybe that isn't the future. And again, I take this agnostic. One overlooked is nice because I feel like that could apply to something that's overlooked for a good reason or something that just hasn't been found sure. yet. It's so, gonna make a buttload of money. So if I could tangent on this real quick. Sure. The, the way I tend to think about it is with um, Kenneth Stanley's uh, gentle earth model. I think, yeah, he calls it gentle earth model. So Kenneth Stanley, he was this roboticist at um, Uber and I think University of Central Florida. And his, his, one of his ideas I really liked was explaining evolution in, in biology as essentially not being goal oriented, like having criteria, it being constraints oriented, like reinforced ventures. That's interesting. So the way this would play out is imagine you had a random number generator for a genome, okay? So your first, you know, you have only four letters, right? A, G, C, and T, right? Okay. And maybe the first genome is- High school bio is coming back to me. <laughs> first one is A, right? Like all the way through, if it's, let's say it's three billion base pairs long, right? And then maybe the next one is like A, and then the last letter is a C, A, and then the last letter so is a So you're just trying to brute force a this? Just like all permutations, right? Yeah. And imagine that in the gentle earth, all genomic permutations that would exist do exist, right? So like most of them are like these like tumor growths. The sure. Blobs, yeah. <laughs> right? Like just like blobs everywhere, but like- it's Or just this, immediate death for some other reason. No, 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 no. No natural selection. Everything is gentle. Everything can live, right? Oh, yeah. okay. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm once aware of the gentle earth. So, so you kind of take that first. Structure? I don't know. And then you imagine, okay, well, we do have these constraints, right? And the constraints like of all those permutations would blot out certain areas, right? That's death. And so then you're like, oh, this is E. coli. Like that didn't get wiped out. That is a red tail hawk. This is a gorilla, right? Whatever. Yeah. Um, and the way I see it is like, it's a, it's a landscape of mountain peaks and valleys. And you know, the um, constraints are maybe like a layer of water and anything above the water survives in the current constraints, anything below it doesn't. And so it's like, as you do that random walk across that topology, across that mountain landscape, um, you don't know what's gonna come up next, right? Yeah, it makes sense. But, but you know that high mountain peaks cluster together, right? Um, so oftentimes if we have a great, you know, roboticist who we invested in, we'll ask them, who else do you know, right? And, and they <laughs> can sense. recommend good people. And we don't know what those things are gonna be, right? It is amazing when you tap into a new group like that. I mean, even from my perspective, like I'm starting to get to know some folks in the San Diego area and some of the roboticists out there, I'm like, I don't know that person. This is interesting, tell me more. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, it is bizarre how much the stuff clusters together. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I don't wanna say 
keep an open mind about it, but definitely um, trying to recognize, j just trying to focus on the constraints as opposed to trying to have some idea of where things are going to end up is your criteria. Okay. Yeah, I think that makes sense loosely. <laughs> cool. Um, so I feel like we're at like a good natural stopping point. Um, is there anything you want to plug while you're here or sort of end off on? I, I guess as a plug, you know, we're always looking for amazing, I guess, weird companies to invest in. Um, so, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you have a pitch deck, you're looking to raise your first round, like feel free to reach out to me. What's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, so either LinkedIn, so linkedin.com slash William Crutt, or I guess I N slash William Crutt. And then, um, if you are an investor and you're looking to gain more exposure to these areas, they're very technical and looking for a fund that's nimble enough to get in before other people recognize the opportunities. Um, you can feel free to join us on angelist.com. Just look up Reinforced Ventures. Nice. Hey, thanks for coming on. I really yeah. appreciate it. Thanks, Spencer. Thank you, Liam.